I want to welcome you to our program tonight on Darfur, First Genocide of the 21st Century, a photo exhibit which has been put together by courtesy of an organization called Waging Peace. Um, and I wanted to welcome you on behalf of the Human Rights Program and introduce Sarah Moberg, whose formal title is that she is the assistant to the director, that's me, but her real work is that she runs the Human Rights Program. And many things that happen in this program wouldn't happen, would not happen without Sarah's uh, support, leadership, and guidance. This project in particular is one that Sarah put together and um, from receiving the contact from our guest, Rebecca Tinsley, making the arrangements to find a suitable exhibit space for the photographs here in the Frankie Institute, um, ordering the food, and together with Eliza Levine and Sion Gormu, two students, post put up all the pictures and then dealt with the um, difficulties engendered by the facts that um, the tape which is not going to harm the walls turned out to be not quite strong enough to hold the pictures up. So they've been running back and forth over the last several days, rehanging pictures, buying more tape, and doing the kind of usually invisible nitty gritty work that is needed in order to come up with the smooth and polished and professional looking presentation of the photograph. So I thought that um, it was appropriate. Sarah wanted me to introduce our speaker. I said, no, you introduce the speaker because you've done the work. And I wanted to publicly thank her and Elisa and Sion for all the work that went into getting us all here, getting us into position so that we could hear an interesting story this evening. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, for your very kind words. Um, just a little bit about the organization that put these drawings together. Uh, Waging Peace is a UK-based human rights organization which campaigns against the systematic human rights abuses and genocide in Darfur. Um, in June and July of 2007, a Waging Peace researcher conducted a three-week fact-finding mis mission in eastern Chad about the crisis in Darfur. While collecting testimonies, she gave children aged 6 to 18 paper and pencils and asked them about their dreams for the future and their memories from the past. Uh, drawings of Genocide um, is a collection of these children's drawings and testimonies, which de depict memories of the shocking atrocities committed against these young witnesses. The drawings are children's witness statements and have been accepted by the International <coughs> Criminal Court as contextual evidence of the crimes committed in Darfur. Um, and we are extremely lucky and grateful to have this exhibit here on campus, and we are even more grateful to have Rebecca Tinsley here to talk about it. Uh, Rebecca Tinsley is a respected journalist and writer who has written in publications such as the New Statesman Times, Independent, and Telegraph. Formerly with the BBC, she has had two novels published, has stood twice for Parliament, and was national chair of the Union of Liberal Students. Rebecca is on the Human Rights Watch <coughs> London Committee and is a trustee of the Carter Center UK and Bosnian Support Fund. She has a law degree from the London School of Economics. Um, and uh, just as a final note, please, afterwards, um, the drawings are all hanging up in the lounge. There's some food, so please feel free to hang around and take a look at the drawings that we have here today. Um, and the exhibit will be up until? May. Oh, until uh, Tuesday, May 26th. Uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, everybody is welcome. So um, with that, I'll give the stage over to Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. If somebody could turn these lights off, please, then you'll be able to see the, the slides better. Um, first, of all, I f uh, first of all, thank you to Susan and to Sarah, and thank you also to, to you and you for putting up the pictures. I know it's very tedious and I'm grateful to you. But first of all, I want to uh, give a disclaimer. Uh, I am not an expert. I'm not an academic. Um, I've never worked for an NGO. I'm unpaid. I am simply someone who all my life has been interested in genocide and I have blundered across Bosnia and now Africa trying to understand why human beings keep on committing genocide. So. Uh, take anything I say with a pinch of salt because I'm not an expert. Uh, the other thing I should mention um, is some housekeeping. If you're interested in anything that I talk about, I've left uh, leaflets from my group, Network for Africa. We actually have two organizations, Waging Peace is the human rights part, Network for Africa is the humanitarian development part. You have to keep them separate in quite a lot of countries because we would all get put in jail. 
uh, if we tried to do the same, the, the, the same, uh, criticize the human rights of a country and run a de development program. If you, we have uh, lots of volunteer opportunities. Uh, we have a, an English language learning center in Rwanda where we teach uh, orphans and widows of the genocide. Uh, and we have a waiting list of 200 people who want to learn. Uh, it's for free. And, but what I do need is volunteers to go and teach English because although we have three Rwandans doing the teaching every day, guess what? Rwandans would like to learn English from a native speaker. They're very, very keen on that. And uh, I promise you that uh, we, do need, we do require a minimum two month stay in Kigali, but and you have, to, you have to pay your own way because we don't have any money. But it will change your life. And if it doesn't change your life, there's something wrong with you. Uh, if you are interested in what we're doing on Darfur and also in our work in northern Uganda with the um, victims of the Lord's Resistance Army or in Rwanda or in Chad in the refugee camps, because um, a, quarter, a quarter of a million Darfuris have fled to Chad, and we're now running uh, development programs there. Please, uh, I've left my notebook there. Please give me your email address or take my, my business card. Uh, I've also left some postcards there with um, an amalgam of the highlights, of you, if you will, of the Darfur drawings. Now, I'm afraid I have to ask for a dollar each for the postcards because although I try and get everything done for free, pro bono, um, I, the cards do cost a bit of money to produce. So I, anyway, um, if there, I'd like you to leave this room this evening with two things in your head. I'm assuming a lot of you know about Darfur anyway, and so forgive me if I make statements of the obvious, but the two things that I have learned as I have blundered across Africa and Bosnia is that genocide is part of the human condition. It is not just something that happens in Africa or in places that we think of as terrifying. It happens because people who consider themselves to be good, believe it or not, get involved in committing genocide. I remember somebody once saying to me, but it's so inhuman. And unfortunately, that's not right. It is human. It is part of our DNA. And we keep doing it, and we keep making the same mistakes. And I get really annoyed when people try to maintain that this is something unique to Africa. It is not. They seem to be forgetting that not that long ago, we had a Holocaust in Europe. Uh, that, that killed six million Jewish people and a large number of other minorities. Uh, they also forget that we had Bosnia not that long ago. Um, and I can't think of a single continent where there hasn't been a genocide. And you can have your own arguments about how you define genocide, but I think the victims of those genocides would probably say that they had suffered genocide. Um, the other point that I would like you uh, to bear in mind um, is that there is a pattern to genocide. Again, it really drives me nuts when people try and maintain that a genocide happened, and it was a big shock. I'm afraid Bill Clinton has quite often gone around saying, Rwanda, oh, we didn't know it was gonna happen, and we didn't know it was happening. Well, guess what? You know, they've got these satellites that they tell us can read license plates from space. Well, I'm sorry, they must have known the Rwandan genocide was happening. The first genocide in Rwanda was in 1959. They knew, I mean, it was gonna happen again because it kept happening again. Admittedly in smaller numbers, but it kept happening. There was a pattern. The international community chose not to look. The Nazi Holocaust, that didn't come out of thin air. Hitler first started writing about his hatred of the Jews in 1922. Every speech he made, he talked about how he wanted to clear the, the, you know, the ethnic cleansing of the Jews. Bosnia, as early as 1989, Slobodan Milosevic was saying he wanted to create a greater Serbia. Anyone who knew the man must have realized he was quite serious about this. But time and time again, the same thing happens, and we refuse to recognize all the early warning signs that there is gonna be a genocide. Please come in and uh, take a seat. And the trouble is we never learn. 
the United Nations, a couple of years ago, decided it would be a good idea to have an early warning system about genocide. So they appointed a magnificent man called Juan Mendez, who actually um, is from Argentina and had been imprisoned uh, during the junta. Well, they spoke here two weeks ago. <laughs> and they then gave him half a secretary and no money. And his job for the UN was to predict where genocide was going to happen. Well, I think we can guess that it really wasn't that much of a priority for them in that case. Here's why I reckon we don't take what happens in Africa seriously. And I call this the sidebar syndrome, for want of a better word for it. Do you remember um, not that long ago in Mumbai, in India, several luxury hotels were taken over by terrorists? And for four days, the world's media was focused on these hotels and the terrible things that was happening there to the, to the people uh, who were caught in the middle. Uh, and, you know, more than 100 people died. And it was awful. And I'm not saying that it wasn't awful. But at the same moment, in those four days, here in northern Nigeria, twice the number of people were being hacked to death in the most terrible bloodletting that was going on. And I'll bet you anything you didn't read about that in your newspaper. Think back to the summer of 2006. There was a war in Lebanon, Hezbollah um, and, the, and the Israelis. And more than 1,000 people died. And again, it was a terrible tragedy. But within 37 days, the entire international community had gathered round and said, we've got to find a solution to this. This is so awful. And they did. They got peacekeepers on the ground. My Darfuri friends find, found this a little bit perplexing because by that stage, the war in Darfur had been going on for three years. 90% of the black African villages had been ethnically cleansed by that point. You know, an estimated 300,000 people were dead. And yet the international community was doing nothing. And this was happening at exactly the same moment. Even more recently, Gaza in January. Again, I'm not saying it wasn't terrible. It was awful what happened in Gaza. You know, but at exactly the same time, there were horrors going on in Africa that nobody bothered to report. Namely, the Lord's Resistance Army, who had been chased out of Uganda into Congo, killed more people in the same period of time than died in Gaza. You didn't read about it. No one was interested. And here's the big one. The Democratic Republic of Congo, the East, here. In the last 10 years, 5.4 million people have died as a consequence of the scramble for resources here in Eastern Congo. 5.4 million people in 10 years. Hardly any publicity about this. What do we have to conclude? They are put in the sidebar of the newspaper, the bit that says mudslide in Colombia kills 600, whereas the main feature is about some celebrity. It says a lot about our values, but it is also indicative of how we value life and events in Africa. When I came back from Darfur in 2004, I remember speaking to uh, a group of people at a church. They should have known better. And one of them said to me, well, it's awful what's happening in Darfur, but, you know, they'll die of AIDS anyway, won't they? And it's Africa. Very difficult when you're up against that attitude. And it also annoys me because, guess what? Millions of people will get up tomorrow morning in Africa and will lead perfectly normal lives. They'll go to school. They'll go to work. They won't pick up a machete. They won't die of starvation. They'll have perfectly loving relationships. And their world won't be horrible. They will cope. They will get on. But we never read about them either. We never read about the extraordinary ability of African women to cope against all the odds and to keep cheerful. You know, all the people in Rwanda I've met who actually will tell me the most unbelievable story about how they survived the genocide by, for instance, you know, a guy I know called Odas, uh, eight years old when the genocide happened. The only reason he survived was because he hid in a ditch under dead bodies for three days and nights with his family bleeding to death on top of him. It's the only reason he survived. And when you talk to Audas, 
who incidentally we're now putting through university. You talk to him, he'll tell you what happened to his family and to himself, and then he'll say, I'm so lucky, because he survived. What an extraordinary mindset. You know, how can you not want to help someone who describes themselves as a survivor, not a victim? I'm sure uh, a lot of you do know about Darfur, so I will try and, uh, I try not to oversimplify this. Several reasons why Darfur is happening. Um, you have to go back to what happened in southern Sudan because all of it's linked. Basically, when the English colonialists left, they left the power with the people who live along the Nile, called the Riverine people, who are largely Arab. These guys, operating out of Khartoum, have basically got a highly centralized system of government. It is not just them against the South or them against Darfur. It's the center against the regions. It's, it's a, a very centralized government. They keep all the oil revenues. They haven't allowed development out here. And so there are very pissed off people in all of these areas around there. So that's one thing, is a lack of development and a sense among the people that the, the center is getting everything. The second thing is Islamism. And I don't know how well acquainted, I, I, people in Europe deep seem to know what Islamism is, but I find not that many people in the States do. Um, it's basically political Islam. Uh, it's a version of Islam, uh, disapproved of by the vast majority of Muslims in the world who are peace-loving, but it's a version of Islam that says that all that man needs is the Quran. You don't need democracy or freedom of speech or elections or anything like that because everything, all the answers are in the Quran and we will interpret how the Quran should be imposed on people. Islamism, it's a bit like, imagine an obscure Christian sect taking over America and saying, we're now gonna make all of you obey our rules and you don't need freedom of speech or elections or anything like that. That's the equivalent. And as I say, most Muslims are horrified by this perversion of, of their religion. The people who took over Khartoum in 1989 are Islamists. They're very good friends of Osama bin Laden. In fact, they gave him a home for five years in the 90s. They basically want to purge Sudan of, of uh, non-Arab tribes. They started out in, in the south, and in the course of 20 years, they killed two million largely black Africans, Christian and animists. Uh, they've now moved on to here. They're trying to ethnically cleanse Darfur of uh, the non-Arab tribes. Here's the thing though, Arabs and non-Arabs, black Africans have lived perfectly peacefully in this place for centuries. Ditto here. And this is where the whole point about propaganda comes in. The people in Khartoum did something quite clever. They realized that the there, was a, there were land arguments in both these places. The black Africans tend to be farmers in both Darfur and the south, and the Arabs tend to be nomads, and there are arguments over who uses the land. The nomads tend to be poorer, so the people in Khartoum are paying the nomads to kill the black Africans. That's what it comes down to. And they did it very successfully in the south, backed up with air, aerial bombardment by the Sudanese Air Force. And now, since 2003, they've been doing it uh, in Darfur. And they've used propaganda to stir up racial hatred. And that's um, an element that isn't terribly politically correct to talk about, but um, one has to. There are, among some Arabs, there's a, there is a racism towards black Africans. They will point to two different surah in the Quran that say that Allah created black, black people basically to be slaves and that they're inferior. And they uh, use that justification uh, for um, the way that they have uh, discriminated against black Africans in Sudan. You know, if you grew up in Darfur, your chances of being able to go to university in Khartoum are pretty slim. And anybody uh, who's a, a black African from Nigeria or any of these other countries who has been to an Arab country to work um, as a laborer will, will give you stories of, of really terrible discrimination. We in the West don't like to consider this. We, 
so often people will say, oh, it's all about resources, or it's all about the fact that the Sahara is moving south. Yeah, those are contributing factors. But as in any genocide, one of the factors you need is hatred. You need an underlying racial hatred. Then you pile on that fear. If you think of the genocides of the 20th century, it wasn't enough that people had racial hatred because of propaganda. The moment you clinch the deal is when you convince that Serb that unless he kills that Bosnian Muslim, that Bosnian Muslim is going to come and rape his daughter. So actually, the Serb is just protecting his family by killing that Bosnian Muslim. You think of all the genocides and the defining moment, certainly in Rwanda, the defining moment was when they said, you've got to kill those Tutsis because they're going to steal your land and your wife and their, your cattle. You're really just doing the right thing, you know? And that's the moment, the fear. There are these, there is, this is what I mean by there being a pattern, unfortunately, in um, so many of these. That another thing that I've noticed in genocides is there's always some academic who will write some book or paper saying, basically, giving the intellectual justification for the genocide, saying, it is uh, the destiny of your generation to make this all Arab. Or, in the case of Hitler, it is the generation to have, uh, you know, it's the, the destiny of your generation to have a greater Germany. And don't shy away from it. This is the moment in history. There's always an academic. These people should know better. But they, you know, they're always there to provide the intellectual justification. They did also in the case of the greater Serbia. Uh, and it is shaming. It also helps if you have um, an education system that encourages obedience. I wish I had a dollar for every time a Rwandan has said to me, you know, part of the problem was that we brought up everybody to obey rules. And so when the instructions came over the radio in 1994 to pick up your machetes and go to work, people obeyed, which is a good reason for all of us to hang on to our civil liberties and to never think that somehow we're immune because none of us can tell what's coming down the road. And it is the responsibility of every generation to defend the achievements of the previous generation uh, in terms of human rights. Here's the technique that was used in Darfur, aerial bombardment by the Sudanese Air Force, followed by an attack by the nomads who are being paid by Khartoum called the Janjaweed. Local people, local Arabs turning on their neighbors. This is, what the, this is the tragedy of it all. Incidentally, a lot of the, uh, the Janjaweed, the Arab nomads, are now <laughs> beginning to realize that they are being used and manipulated by Khartoum. And there's quite an interesting situation developing uh, where they're, um, they're no longer not, I mean, some of them are still being bribed and paid by Khartoum to do the killing and the ethnic cleansing, but they are, there is a, at least this is a very hopeful sign uh, that they are beginning to actually talk to the Darfur rebels and say, hey, haven't we got more in common than we do keeping us separate? And that, that to me is, is very hopeful. That's what these villages look like once the Janjaweed and the Air Force had been through there. Uh, I should mention that all the ordnance is sold to Sudan by the Chinese, uh, who take 80% of Sudan's oil. And the reason why uh, the UN Security Council never actually enforces any of the resolutions on Darfur is that two members of the, two of the five on the Security Council, Russia and China, are selling arms and China is taking oil. There's also, incidentally, another reason that um, the UN Security Council won't do anything is the whole issue of state sovereignty. Russia and China do not want to set a precedent of intervening in another country because of human rights, because in the case of Russia, there's Chechnya, and in the case of China, there's Tibet and the, um, the, uh, the situation with the, the Uyghur Muslim uh, minority. So they don't want that. Uh, precedent being set. Um, 
I have to uh, warn you, uh, some of the photographs you're about to see are quite um, unpleasant. They were taken by a doctor we know uh, on his cell phone. And they, uh, these are photographs from a clinic. The Sudanese, uh, you would think that you know, life would get better when you get to a refugee camp in Darfur, but unfortunately that's not so. Not only do the Janjaweed generally set up shop three miles away, so that they can continue to rape and terrorize the people. But the Sudanese security forces regularly go in and uh, beat the hell out of people and keep a, a, a state of fear. And also, of course, they restrict the movement of the humanitarian agencies, those that they have not kicked out. Um, so there are many instances of people being seriously injured in the camps. Uh, I warn you about these photos because um, I have chosen the least awful pictures, but I don't want you to sue me for mental cruelty. Um, there we are. That um, is standard, standard torture to scrape away the skin right down to the bone. What I find so difficult about that is um, the poor guy who suffered that, <laughs> he didn't even pass out when this was done. I'd always sort of thought in my mind, you know, I'd pass out. No. He didn't even get that. This is a happier story. This young man is called Rashid. When he was eight years old, the Janjaweed came to his village and they threw him on a fire, having killed his mum and dad and his brother. And then they rode away. And Rashid's grandmother pulled him off the fire, but not before, as you can see, his arm had been quite deformed. Now, there are thousands of kids like Rashid in Darfur, and they're getting no treatment whatsoever. But we were sick of not being able to get any publicity whatsoever. And so we put our morals to one side, and we thought, you know what? People don't care about 300, 400,000 dead. Maybe they'll care about one cute little boy. And of course they did. So we got a newspaper to run a national campaign in Britain, appealing for money so that we could send Rashid to South Africa to have the operations to fix his arm, and of course they ran with that story because, you know, isn't it nice? To hell with all those other people sitting in refugee camps uh, for whom nothing will be done, but at least we were able to get the story into the open. It still makes me feel kind of queasy though, this, this whole syndrome, but there we are. As I say, these were the least terrible photographs that I had. The drawings. First of all, I should say, I went to Darfur uh, in October of 2004 at the height of the killing. The only reason I got in was that I had been in Syria the week before, and believe it or not, I had learned enough Arabic to be able to buy plane tickets. And I turned up at the airport in Khartoum with my friend, a British parliamentarian, at 4.30 in the morning, and I unleashed my appalling Arabic on the man selling the tickets. And my friend, the British parliamentarian, said, you know, he was so shocked and appalled by what you did to his language that you sort of, you caught you, his defenses came down and he gave you the tickets. Otherwise, we should not have been on that plane because any of you who are planning uh, a future career as a genocidal dictator, you may want to make a note that one of the prerequisites is that you don't let any press in. Always have a vacuum. Keep as many NGOs out as you can and keep the press out and scare the NGOs you do have. That's the situation we have now. So um, we uh, went to Darfur. For, we were there for only three days before they chucked us out. They did catch up with us uh, and put us on a plane back to Khartoum. But while we were there, my male friend interviewed men and I interviewed women in the refugee camps. And um, the women had walked for as much as two weeks, just carrying what they could. Their villages had been bombed, the Janjui had come in, they'd burnt everything, they'd killed the men and the boys and dumped their bodies in wells to poison the water supply. They had raped the women fairly systematically and uh, they'd stolen the livestock, set fire to the houses and destroyed all of the villages. And this was a pattern. I kept being told the same thing by different people. 
with you know occasional little bits of horror like I interviewed this woman who they described as very very old she was probably my age but you don't live to be that long <laughs> in this environment uh, but she uh, had been gang raped by the Janjaweed and because she was older they had brought along a razor blade to cut open her vagina which was atrophied with age so they're they're all prepared what I found absolutely extraordinary interviewing the women. First of all, I should say that an awful lot of Africans don't just divulge the fact that they've been raped because they have a different society from ours. People don't go on TV there and spill their guts and tell you all kinds of really inappropriate things that you didn't want to hear anyway about their private lives. They have a lot more dignity generally. I know you shouldn't generalize, but I have noticed there's quite a lot more dignity and people don't divulge these things. So I had to win these women's trust. Eventually, instead of using euphemisms like beaten and harassed, we did get to the truth, which was that they were being raped. You know, including six-year-olds, including really quite old women. And the remarkable thing was the pattern. They would say to me um, that they were branded like slaves and they were called slave and other ra racial insults. They were told that they were inferior and therefore that the men raping them were diluting their blood. And they were told that there would be three genocides. The first genocide is when we kill your men. The second genocide uh, is when we rape you because in a traditional society, of course, the women become stigmatized, having been raped, and you actually destroy that society. So the second genocide is destroying your society. And the third genocide is when you get AIDS because they're HIV positive. What I found so bizarre was that I had interviewed women in Bosnia and in Rwanda, who had been raped, and their rapists had said exactly the same things. People who could never have known about each other. And this is when I realized, rape really is a weapon of war. It's how you destroy a society. Incidentally, rape doesn't exist in Islam. Uh, the president of Sudan says um, it just doesn't happen. Therefore, all the women who I interviewed were either prostitutes or they're lying. He also says that if you get pregnant when you've been raped, you must have enjoyed it. That's the mindset. And all of this, incidentally, is Israeli uh, propaganda. I'm part of a, a Zionist plot uh, you know, to bring down the Sudanese government. It's, it's, it's that level. So why these drawings matter is that there really are not many images of the genocide happening in Darfur. They have kept out the press. They have so terrified the local NGOs that they, the humanitarians, they will not talk about what's going on because they know they'll be thrown out. They will, they know that they will be impeded even more. And that is why it drives me nuts when, you know, they'll put someone from a humanitarian agency on the TV and say, tell us what's happening in Darfur. They can't, they can't tell you. You know, they, they are literally risking their lives. The Sudanese government has a remarkable intelligence gathering system, supplied, I believe, by American companies, incidentally, so they can look at every email, listen to every phone conversation. I met a guy who worked for an Irish aid agency, a humanitarian agency. He told me that he had been home to Ireland for you know, a three-week R&R. And while he'd been there, he'd been in some really obscure village in, in, near Galway, and he'd given an interview to his local paper read by, you know, three people and a, and a goat. And he'd said, you know, what's happening in Darfur is terrible. They've killed, you know, uh, 300,000 people. It's ethnic cleansing. It's racism. And he really thought nothing of it. He gets back to Darfur and instantly he's called in by the chief of police who has the article there from this obscure Irish paper. It says, you've been, you've been spreading lies about what's happening here, and the message got through. So that's why this matters, is because these images do show what is going on. And it contradicts the Sudanese government's version of what's going on. For instance, they deny that there um, are tanks involved with this, or indeed any soldiers. Um, they, there we are, a tank flying the Sudanese flag. Can't get more obvious than that. 
The other thing that's interesting about this drawing, there are a few academics around who will say, this has nothing to do with race, because everybody's intermarried. It's nothing to do with ethnicity. And they're right. Everyone is intermarried. But guess what? If you are a black African, this is how you portray yourself. And that is how you portray an Arab. In other words, they think that the Arab has skin like mine. That is how people... What really matters is how people self-identify, not how someone, an academic, in the safety of an American university, how they define you. These children define themselves as black African and a whole generation who, you know, their grandfathers would never have thought of the racial difference between Arab and black African. And this is the tragedy of this. Now they think of themselves in racial terms. Absolutely tragic. Here we have an image that we all hoped had gone with the slave trade. This is black African women being roped together to be led off to slavery. Hundreds and hundreds of women, always young girls, the younger and the prettier the better, are being put on planes from Darfur to Khartoum where they are distributed among Sudanese army officers as presents to use as they wish. The slave trade is back, not that it ever went away, of course, since there is a massive amount of slavery across a whole band of northern Africa, but again, nobody wants to talk about that. Most of these drawings are by kids that were seven, eight, nine, ten years old, had never seen an airplane before. They don't have TV. There's no way, you know, you couldn't suggest these things to these children. This is what they have seen. Now, and again, the Sudanese government denies this is happening, that they're sending in Antonovs and helicopters to bomb people. The bombs are made, uh, 500 pound bombs made of scrap metal and explosive to cause maximum damage when it, when it comes down there. Um, these were accepted, um, Susan said, these were accepted by the International Criminal Court in The Hague as evidence of the context of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And it was really cool for us to be able to go back to the camps and to say to the kids who drew them, you are going to play a role in holding to account the people who killed your father and your brother. It is quite disempowering to be in a, to be in a camp for a long time, to be you know, your society is absolutely breaking down. This is a very traditional society. You know, these folks, I remember a guy saying to me, I'm a farmer. I'm used to my neighbor being a hundred yards away, not one yard away. This is not where I want to be. Very empowering for us to be able to go back there. We also collected support drawings by kids all over the world. Once we started showing these, we got spontaneously kids from all over the place drawing us solidarity drawings. And we've taken them back and we've displayed them in the camps in Chad. We can't get into Darfur anymore because we're enemies of the Sudanese state. Um, so there's a quarter of a million people in camps just over the border in Chad, which is where we're now working. And we've displayed these. And people find it amazing because they feel so isolated. They really think the world has forgotten them, which it has, largely. Uh, and so it's been great to take the drawings back and to tell the kids that they are playing a role in ending the impunity of the people who have been killing uh, them. But it's not enough. It's just not enough. You only have to look at these to know that these children are traumatized. So we, I mentioned we have a little uh, humanitarian group as well. Because I'm involved in Rwanda, I've... Um, encountered a huge number of very, very traumatized people there who have had nothing since the genocide 15 years ago. It's an incredibly poor country. They simply don't have the infrastructure to even give people an aspirin or an anti-malaria pill, let alone psychotherapy. 
So what we have done is we have been working on the traditional wise auntie system that you get in some African countries where there is always a woman in the village who is considered wise, responsible, respected, and to whom you go with your troubles. What we've done is we've gathered together the wise aunties and we've brought in psychotherapists and we've trained, we do a three week course where we train the wise aunties. Doesn't matter if they're literate or not, believe me. You know, just because you're not literate, it doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means you haven't had a chance to go to school. We train the wise aunties in all the sort of techniques of psychotherapy. First of all, how to relax, how to begin to listen to other people, because most of us never actually listen. We're just sitting there waiting for our next turn to speak. How to listen, how to breathe, how to relax, and then most important, how to break the cycle of trauma, because literally millions of people in Rwanda are living a, an ongoing hell. They keep being re-traumatized. Just something in everyday life will trigger you know, a memory that is too hideous to, believe, to be believed. Anyway, we have been doing this with great success. We've, uh, we go back every three or four months with the psychotherapist to do a refresher course, and we now have amazing squadrons of wise aunties who go out into villages, and they do the cascade system. This has been so successful that um, people in northern Uganda, in the camps uh, of the people terrorized by the Lord's Resistance Army, they have asked us to go and replicate the system there, which we're now doing. We've just had our third trip to northern Uganda. And we're now starting to do it in Chad. A lot more difficult because it is a very traditional Muslim society. Very hard to get people to understand that actually the reason that their stomach hurts all the time is not because there's something wrong with their stomach, it's because they've witnessed this kind of thing. However, it is the most satisfying stuff that I think I've um, ever been involved in. This is one of the young artists. And this is what gives me hope. The women of Africa, I know you can't generalize, but I'm going to because um, I'm going on the strength of working in 10 African countries and it always warms my heart. These folks have so little and they make do and they cope and they improvise and they are a constant inspiration to me that in the middle of the most terrible circumstances, they start the day with a song. You know, and you come, and people, I mean, it's very odd, people, you know, when I come back to England or to the States, people say to me, it must be so depressing working there. And I feel like saying, no, it's depressing coming here and having you tell me that you had a lousy day because you couldn't park your car. It just changes your priorities and the way you think of things. Why hasn't anything happened about Darfur? One of the problems is international indifference. Let's be honest, the world community has just not worked together on this one. They're not interested. There are several, re several reasons for that. One is that the Sudanese regime, very, very cleverly, has spun their encounter with Osama bin Laden. The, you know, the Sudanese intelligence chiefs are honored guests with both the CIA and MI6 in Britain. And they have played the war on terror to their advantage. So that at the same time as our leaders say, it's absolutely terrible what you're doing in Darfur, we're also saying, please come to our country and tell us everything you know about Osama bin Laden. Which I find bizarre because the guy was there 15 years ago. I can't imagine what intelligence they have that's of any use. But unfortunately, um, Saddam, you know, they, they may be, uh, it may be a revolting dictatorship that is authoritarian, totalitarian, no freedom of speech, huge numbers of Arab intellectuals tortured and killed, all of those things. They are clever though. One of the things they've realized is the international community, we do the same thing in all of these genocides. The first thing we do is we deny that it's genocide. We deny the genocidal intent and we deny the numbers. And that has happened so often. There are um, minutes have been released of meetings that both Churchill and Roosevelt had during the Second World War when representatives of the Jewish community in Europe went to see them and warned them about what was happening, about the concentration camps. And these minutes of these meetings have been released. And in both cases, both Roosevelt and Churchill said afterwards to their aides, well, you know, I think they know Jewish people tend to be a bit hysterical. 
you know, I think they're exaggerating, aren't they? They're just, you know, trying to get our attention, but they're making a bit of a fuss. And it's happened every time. The other thing we do is moral equivalency. We say, you know what, they're all as bad as each other. You know, these, these Janjaweed and these Darfur rebels, the Bosnians and the Serbs, they're all as bad as each other. The reason we do this is because if you believe that, then you have no moral obligation to do anything about it. And that, of course, is, is absolutely what people want. Um, there, we also uh, have a trick of calling a political problem, which is what Darfur is, we call it a humanitarian disaster, which means you have a humanitarian response. You send them loads of blankets and biscuits instead of finding a political solution because that's far too much effort. I remember a guy in Sarajevo during the siege saying to me, because we were uh, running food convoys into both Bosnia and Kosovo during the war, and I remember him saying to me, this is uh, lovely of you to give us the food. You're keeping me alive so the Serbs can kill me. And indeed, uh, a woman I interviewed in Darfur saying to me, very nice of you to send the food, but you know, this is Africa and we're quite used to coping without much food. What I'd really like you to do is take the guns away from the people who are killing us. And of course, we are actually more likely to buy that woman a Mercedes Benz than we are to do what we really need to do, which is to realize this needs a political solution and it needs a coherent international response to it. And of course, my favorite reason uh, that we do nothing is that we always get tied up in peace talks. Okay, this has been going on forever. Diplomats will sit down with mass murderers and say, no, 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 he's not the architect of the genocide. He's our partner in the search for peace. And the guy who everybody has copied is Slobodan Milosevic. He was brilliant at this. He realized the mindset of the diplomats, that they didn't want to have to actually work out something awkward and difficult like a political solution that had long-term implications. Instead, they wanted to do a deal with the people in power. And so there were endless peace talks throughout the five years of the Bosnian War. And each peace deal the Serbs signed was not worth anything. My favorite moment was when the British Foreign Secretary, who had appointed himself as lead diplomat, a ridiculous man, Lord Carrington, tells you everything you need to know about him, he'd, he'd, he'd signed this bit of paper and, and praised Milosevic as, you know, our new partner in the search for peace. And as he was signing the peace deal, the Serbs started shelling the room he was in because they'd already broken the ceasefire. So he had to hide under the table. And the, the man had no shame about this at all, which I find just intriguing. Sadly, we're doing exactly the same thing right now in Darfur, is that uh, we keep appeasing the people with power. There is another factor in this that is very depressing, and that is African leaders don't give a damn about Darfur. African citizens care deeply. If you listen to the BBC World Service or the Voice of America or any phone-in show in Africa, there are loads and loads of African citizens who are furious that 400,000 people have died in Darfur and nothing has been done. Their leaders don't give a damn. And this is part of a pattern of African indifference among the ruling class who are entirely different people uh, than the ordinary African. And the reason this is happening, first of all, here's a, here's a little uh, test. Uh, there was only one African leader who made any noise during the Rwandan genocide. Only one. Can any of you guess who that was? Hmm? No. No, Tabo and Becky was involved in keeping the Rwandan genocide from ever being discussed at the UN. He has blood all over his hands, that man. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I'm thinking of Kofi Annan. Dreadful man. Um, no, it was, it was actually Nelson Mandela was the only leader in Africa who spoke out about the Rwandan genocide. Here's the, the horrible truth, is that an awful lot of African dictators have been bought off by Arab money. And they will stay completely silent when it comes to a genocide being perpetrated by Arabs, even though this is Muslim killing Muslim. And the reason they're being bought off is that when it comes to the United Nations, their votes can be counted on on anti-Israel motions. Also, if you go into any African capital, you will find 
uh, uh, you know, a King Faisal hospital. Trinkets, mere trinkets buy off these people. And they should be absolutely ashamed of themselves. There's another issue, of course, which is nobody likes the spotlight being shone on a regime's uglier side, because guess what? It might one day come round and expose what you're up to as well. And so they don't particularly want that to happen. What should be done to help these folks? These, incidentally, are young women in Farshana camp, just over the border, in Chad. What should be done? I really don't think it's difficult. And I don't think it involves boots on the ground. I don't think it involves an intervention. What we need to do is to uh, enforce the existing UN resolutions. There are loads of great resolutions, and they've been voted on. And the extraordinary thing is that they're just sitting there on the books, and nobody's enforced them. The first thing to do is a no-fly zone. This has already been voted on by the UN. It would basically stop the Sudanese from bombing their own, you know, their own citizens, from bombing their villages. And yet absolutely nothing has been done about this. There are other things that could be done, like targeted sanctions against the architects of the genocide. It's important that you always follow the money with these things and ignore all the bull about ideology, because so often it's about, it's about personal greed and enrichment. There are also, third, there, there are a web of business interests that the Sudanese government has its claws into. If we are able to uh, go after terrorists and if we are able to go after narco-criminals with our sophisticated computer systems, why on earth aren't we freezing the bank accounts of these rather sinister parastatal organizations that the Sudanese government has? You know, the Sudanese, um, they have revenues of a million dollars a day through their oil. 80% of that goes on buying weapons. This is something we could do. We, we could really do something about that. And incidentally, extraordinary, there is not an arms embargo on Sudan. There isn't one. There's one on Darfur, duh. So you sell them to Khartoum, and they put them on a truck or in a helicopter, and they send them there. How extraordinary that you know six years into this genocide, we're still allowing the, the uh, the arms to be shipped in there by the Russians and the Chinese. Divestment. Now, um, we're in a state that has a, a very good record on this. Um, I believe the state of Illinois has already divested itself, um, and it's incredibly impressive. Incredibly. If only everybody followed that. I mean, there's still so much work to be done on this. Um, we could actually equip the peacekeepers properly. How about that? The one feeble thing the UN has done is that, as you probably know, there's an African Union hybrid force with the UN. Peacekeepers, supposed to be 26,000 of them. Two years in, only 15,000 are there. We recently did a survey and went round and talked to quite a few of the peacekeepers. Not only do they not have enough water, they are each given one yogurt and one bread roll a day to live on. Out of every 10 vehicles, only four have a battery, and they don't have any gas. How on earth do we imagine that these people are going to patrol you know, an area the size of Texas with no resources whatsoever? It just shows, yet again, we are not serious about taking them on. And finally, my favorite instrument, lever, that we could use against the architects of this dictatorship is a travel ban. When I came back from um, Darfur, I'd been there for three days. I then had uh, several overnight flights to get me back to London. And to put it bluntly, I was pretty smelly by the time I got off the plane in London. Um, and to my horror, my, my friend who I was traveling with, this British parliamentarian, a member of the House of Lords, he got on his cell phone halfway through our trip back, and he'd organized a big meeting in Parliament for us to speak to, literally the moment we got back. No chance to go and have a shower. It was a humiliating moment. It was also a <coughs> surreal moment, because uh, you know, turning up and speaking to this big meeting of lords and MPs and everything. We have an urban myth in Britain about how um, you have this awful nightmare that you're speaking to the House of Lords and you wake up and you are. 
And I, I was. And the bizarre thing was I, um, uppermost in my mind was this woman called Hawa that I had met. She was 18 years old. She had escaped her camp. Her father and mother had been killed, her brothers, her uncles, all the men in the family. She escaped just holding her, her baby brother. And she had walked for days. She got to the camp, and no, there wasn't a tent waiting. There wasn't even a cup of tea waiting. They just said to her, there's some land, go and build your own hut. And she had to go out again and get the reeds with which to build her hut. And of course, there is the risk every time they go outside the camp that they get raped. Hawa had an extraordinary story. And I stood up at this meeting, and I talked about what Hawa had been through and the other women I had met. Sitting right in the front row is the Sudanese ambassador to London. And he was completely unmoved when I talked about all the people who'd been murdered, about how you know, the Sudanese government was bombing its own civilians, about the, the really the disgusting things being done in particular to the, the women who'd survived. Absolutely unmoved. He looked rather bored by it all. Then we got on to the bit where we talked about sanctions. How do we stop this? I got to the bit where I said, and there should be a travel ban on the architects of this genocide. He went ape. He went absolutely nuts because he wants his shopping trips to Paris. That's what it comes down to. It's really no more sophisticated than that. The self-interest and greed of these people is, is breathtaking. So we have all of these levers. What we lack is a coherent international voice and people prepared to work together. Let us hope that now that you have a new administration here, that might happen. Now, I realize that this has been a bit of a downer. Um, and I want to leave you with two little thoughts. Um, the reason I keep going back and doing what I do is one keeps meeting really extraordinary people who define themselves as survivors rather than victims. And in any genocide, you see the worst of humanity, but you also see the best. You see the most extraordinary things being done by very, very ordinary people. And I think of one genocide that happened in Europe 60 years ago, the Holocaust. I went recently to uh, a concentration camp that is not well known. It's called Nordhausen. And it, there's not, you know, virtually nobody talks about what happened at Nordhausen. It was a mine in the Hartz Mountains. And the Nazis decided it would be a brilliant place to build rockets because you could fly over and you wouldn't see anything because the mine was sideways into a mountain. It was like a James Bond kind of, you know, huge cavern. 20,000 Russian prisoners of war at any given time were working inside this mountain building V2 rockets. And they didn't have shoes, and they only had those awful striped pajamas. And the German winter is incredibly cold. And so quite a lot of them, of course, died. And in fact, you can see the book in which the Nazi accountant worked out how many calories were necessary each day to keep these people alive for three months. Then they decided they were expendable anyway, and they'd have a new shipment of, Soviet, of Russian soldiers to do the work. What I found extraordinary was that, you know, the conditions were unspeakable. They were lined up building these V2 rockets. If anybody did anything wrong, they were immediately hung from meat hooks on the roof. And every day, the prisoners would have to walk in and out underneath their decomposing bodies. There's quite a lot of incentive you know, to obey the rules. And yet, the vast majority of those V2 rockets were sabotaged by the people who built them. Most of them didn't work because those Russians stood there in those ghastly conditions deliberately sabotaging those rockets. What extraordinary spirit. Incidentally, the man, the Nazi, the SS officer responsible for Nordhausen, he came to America and he put man on the moon. His name was Werner von Braun, and he rebranded himself. And the American authorities literally tied up, uh, ripped up his SS file and rebranded him as a good American. So, but I always think about those, those extraordinary, that courage. And the other thing that I always held in my mind 
There's a woman in Rwanda called Patricia, who I met on my first visit there, and I've seen her every time since. The first time I met her, she was thin and gaunt and quite traumatized. But here was Patricia's story. Um, she and her husband ran a small store in their town, so they were uh, quite elite people. And when the Hutu came into their village, they were the first people <coughs> they headed for because they were people who had money, Tutsi of, of status. Patricia, incidentally, is, is like a sort of six foot two black swan. She is simply gorgeous, very, very, very obviously Tutsi. They uh, killed three of her four children and they killed her husband. And as they gang raped Patricia, they dismembered her husband on the ground beside her. Patricia is left with one kid. And the first thing she does, she has nothing. She lives in a hut that she managed to build for herself. The first thing she does is that she adopts six orphans that she finds just hang around on the road. That's what I mean about the best of the human spirit. And it, it, never, you know, it never ceases to amaze me that people can be so strong and so decent in the face of all this. Every day since I came back from Darfur, I have slept in a comfortable bed and I've had a full stomach. And I'm ashamed to say that, you know, the ladies there said to me, please be our voice. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm not really equipped to do that. I'm white, I'm privileged, you know, what do I know? But they said, you're here, <laughs> go back and be our voice. And it shames me to say that it has been a real struggle to be a voice for them at all. And I don't even know if they're still alive because last Christmas, the camp I visited in Darfur was attacked by the Sudanese. However, um, that's why I'm here today. If any of you are interested in our work, please sign my book. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for turning up.